Okay, so a very warm welcome, everyone. Uh, we have uh, um, an important guest today, uh, Mauro Dorado from the uh, Roma Trier University. Uh, thank you very much, Mauro, for being here today. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, an important uh, topic uh, for our project uh, and also for future initiatives that uh, uh, we'll be organizing. Um, Mauro will talk about uh, the philosophical stages of cosmic time today. And uh, we welcome him very much. Uh, Thank and, you, uh, I Thank leave you for time. having me. So the chat, the chat is on. Uh, uh, well, basically I'd like just to go to the, uh, let's see if this works. All right, so as we will see, uh, cosmic time has been basically introduced into cosmology in the early 20s. And the definition of cosmic time just depends on some sort of symmetrical assumption that we make about the universe. So it's model dependent, first of all, as you will see, and it's also statistic uh, dependent in the sense that uh, you need to perform some sort of averaging to impose to space time a structure of um, uniformly developing uh, fundamental observers. So the question basically is, uh, is it an existing uh, entity or being just a product of some sort of complicated and imprecise statistical uh, techniques. It's merely an instrumental uh, posit that cosmologists uh, assume in order to make some calculation or in order to make calculation easier. And I will try to defend this radical thesis um, according to which uh, this hypothesis in some sort of neo-Kantian sense that needs to be specified, and I will do that later on, is a constitutive principle of cosmology. This uh, session holds only for certain models of the evolution of the universe and also for certain st stages of the evolution of the universe. And so this is the plan. I will just quickly review the mathematical uh, conditions for the existence of cosmic time. And then I will go into the physical uh, conditions for its existence, uh, if indeed it exists, we'll see this a problem later on. There will be uh, also a part devoted to the analysis and evaluation of a uh, well-known criticism of both Gödel and Gixen more recently against the existence of cosmic time. And finally, I will just go over the evidential status of cosmic time in models, symmetric models of the universe, and namely the Friedman, Robertson, and Walker uh, universes. And in the last part, I will try to justify my uh, solution, or at least attempt, attempt uh, of a solution uh, to uh, the question with which I started, namely, is it a system or is it just a conventional posit? And so let us uh, start with uh, the mathematical uh, models that um, I guess you all know. Uh, so we have a triple of entities, we have a manifold, and then we have a metric tensor and a stress energy tensor. Uh, there are two definitions of causality that are very important for our purpose. The first is strong causality, and the second is stable causality. The latter uh, implies the former, but not vice versa. I'm taking these definitions from Wall, Bob Wall's famous book, General Relativity. Suppose that uh, the manifold is strongly causal, that means that for every P in the manifold, there is no causal, there is no caused time occurs near this point which comes arbitrarily close to intersect itself. Basically, uh, this tells us that cosmic time is related to the absence of closed time-like curves in more picturesque way to the absence of the possibility of travel, of doing some sort of time travel. 
And stable causality rules out the possibility that if you slight open up these light cones in strongly causal space time, you may end up in producing closed time like curves. And the definition here uh, is as follows. We will see why stable causality is definitely very important for the definition of a cosmic time. A manifold is said to be stably causal if there is a function which is differentiable, smooth function, infinitely times differentiable on the manifold. And of course, the codomain is going to be real numbers such that whenever we have a point P in the causal future of Q, it is always the case that uh, P is before Q. So that we never have uh, time like curves intersecting themselves. Another way of saying this is that this function, the cosmic time function increases along every future directly time like curve. Time like curves are basically the trajectories that describe the career of particles in space time they need not be observers. And finally, uh, this is definition. Uh, it's, as you see, um, a definition that implies the fact that uh, there is a restriction on the admissible models of the equations. So we have <laughs> a cosmic time function, if and only if there is this differentiable uh, function from M to the reals, such that I will explain the notation as we go along. For every pair of points in the manifold, whenever P is in the causal future of Q, then the time associated to Q is strictly uh, smaller than the time associated to P. This means basically that uh, the causal future of a point is the set of points that can be causally influenced by the vertex of the light cone. So the causal future basically is whatever can be influenced by the vertex of the cone. So if a point belongs to the causal future of another point, the former point has to be somehow later than the first. We, this obviously implies that we don't have cause closed time lapse curves. And one way to understand this in a probably clearer way is to use a metaphor that um, David Malaman proposed in his introduction to Gödel's um, unpublished paper. Just imagine a rope, a rope made, made, made of very many fibers, all of which are parallel to each other. Now compare these fibers to timeline curves and cut across the rope in such a way that the angles between the plane and the fibers is always 90 degrees. But if you twist the fibers, if you twist the rope, is it, it's not possible to cut this rope in such a way that each fiber forms a perpendicular angle with respect to the plane. If you think about it, twisting the rope means that each fiber can basically cross um, any point inf infinitely many times. And each fiber represents uh, some sort of rotation in the universe, which is the weird property that Gödel found when he found his solution to uh, the Einstein field equation. So basically, to summarize, you have cosmic time whenever you don't find in the space-time closed time-like curves. This is an interesting fact which has been immediately stressed by cosmologists, namely that general theory of relativity introduces in some sense properties that we know very well were attributable only to Newtonian time. Namely, we know that in a special theory of relativity, 
some events, namely those that are space-like related, don't have any objective temporal order. So the temporal order in the spatial theory is only partial. Since here we have this uh, orthogonal uh, congruence uh, with respect to which we have a congruence, namely remember these fibers, the fibers of the rope, you can slice the rope in such a way that each time associated to a point of the fiber shares the time with all the other points. And if the fiber extends to the whole manifold, then we do have some sort of global ordering here. The, meaning that any two points in space-time can be compared from a time from a temporal point of view. Namely, there is an event, take an event, this event is either simultaneous with another event, or before or later another event. And this is actually important because as we will see, both Einstein, Eddington, genes, and then of course, uh, the later cosmologists like, uh, for instance, Withrow, believe that the cosmic time and general relativity and those models that in introduce cosmic time, in fact, reintroduce some properties of Newtonian space-time. Now I need some sort of uh, definitions. We will skip, I guess, quickly over them. Uh, I basically need two notions. One is the notion of homogeneity and the other one is the notion of isotropy. Uh, think of space-time as a stack of cards. Uh, in this case, you have a, what it's called technically a foliation of the manifold. This basically means that uh, if there is this uh, metric preserving map such that for any points, for any two pair, for any two points in the hypersurface, there is an isometry that takes this point P to another point Q. Whenever this is the case, it means that in that card, space is the same or space at the time looks the same. I had prepared here, if I can go, at the end of the talk, there is a picture that I took of there. This is the homogeneity. This is uh, a couple of hypersurfaces at a given time. I take the two points P and Q, if for any points there is this uh, metric preserving map that takes one point to the other, then we have homogeneity. In flat space time, we can consider this invariance uh, basically involving parallel transport. But here, of course, the space time is curved, so we cannot talk about parallel transportation. We had to introduce this more technical notion of the isometry. And then the other notion that I want to talk about is the notion of isotropy. As uh, everybody knows, if they study Aristotelian physics, in Aristotle's space-time, uh, we have a privileged uh, spatial direction, which is up and down. If the universe is isotropic, there is no preferred spatial direction. How do we transform this intuition, which is valid, in Euclidean space-time, namely flat space-time, into a Riemannian manifold with variable curvature. First of all, we need a notion of congruence. A congruence is simply a thread, think of the fibers, that basically cuts across the whole space-time. It's a family of non-intersective, intersecting time-like curves. This is the congruence that you see. Uh, this U, uh, A, is a time-like uh, tangent vector. And these two vectors are orthogonal to the velocity here, S1 and S2. If space-time is isotropic, leave fixed P and the vector E, U, which is the velocity vector, 
there is always an isotropy that rotates S1 into S2. So it's never the case that there is a privileged direction because for any pair of points in space, of course, here we are using a three-dimensional, find the three-dimensional picture because we cannot imagine a four-dimensional picture. So we have to reduce one dimension here. If you can rotate, then the space-time is isotropic. Now, let me go. Uh, to the link between cosmic time and the cosmological principle, which is basically a generalization of the Copernican idea that uh, there is no center in the solar system, or I'm sorry, there is a center in the solar system, but if we extend uh, uh, the domain of interest to say the back of the galaxy, uh, from each point in the galaxy, we would basically see the same physical situation if isotropy holds. But let me put this in a clearer words, in, a cl in clearer ways. <coughs> uh, first of all, matter, the stress, energy, tensor is idealized. It's a fluid. So each galaxy basically uh, is like a grain of dust. And if we want to create this sort of isotropic uh, uh, matter, we have to imagine that this grain of dust are basically squeezed together. So matter here is a fluid with no pressure. Now, if we have this isotropy, remember all spatial direction are basically equivalent. There is no observer uh, I would just define the notion of fundamental observer that can have a distinct velocity with respect to the others. So imagine uh, you go large scale, you get a cluster of galaxy and even above that, a super cluster of galaxies, you attribute this enormous mass to a point. You call this point fundamental point or fundamental snapshot of a particle describing um, a world line in the universe. Now assume that there are other fundamental particles elsewhere. And if you assume isotropy and homogeneity, you know that the proper time associated to one of these fundamental observable particles can be extended because there's no difference across this spatial hypersurface. This means that the proper time used by this fundamental observer in a region of the universe can be extended to the proper times of the other observers. And this is a way to understand, I think, in a clearer sense, what it means to have uh, an asymmetric cosmological model. A symmetric cosmological model presupposes isotropy, homogeneity, and the possibility of finding some sort of main motion of matter with respect to which you basically introduce some reference frame and each observer say located in the center of these reference frames moves with the mean motion of matter meaning that there is a reference frame that is global across space-time uh, in which basically you can imagine uh, various points where all these observers are located and all of them measure the same pressure and the same density of matter. So these hypersurfaces are characterized by the fact that the physical uh, quantities along them are constant. And in fact, the space time are characterized by the fact that curvature is constant. Now, uh, this is the a uh, famous Robertson and Walker metric. We don't need to you know, care about the details, but the idea is that if we assume isotropy and homogeneity, we can imply, we can derive, sorry, this metric, which is composed by these five ingredients. Uh, our cosmic time is T. Remember cosmic time is this slicing of the universe with cards that intersect uh, in a perpendicular way relative to uh, 
the trajectories in time of this fundamental observers. Then we have this radial coordinate along which uh, the fundamental observer, uh, so to speak, moves. And then we have these angles, which are measured when R is zero. The point R is zero is the point where basically everything starts. And I think we should now go to define uh, in a clearer sense by quoting this famous physicist, why the introduction of cosmic time in cosmology in those highly symmetric models <clears throat> that we just presented also in a technical way, isotropic and, homoge and homogeneous model, why in these models you can introduce this global time. And this is Einstein to Adam Fest. It's a letter that's been uh, published in this um, enormous uh, set of volumes, which in fact gathered these very precious and collected papers and letters. This is a letter that he wrote to Adam Fest. 26th of uh, November, he writes, what is, this, what is strange is that now we are in 1917, in the end, a quasi-absolute time and a preferred coordinate system appears again, but with full respect for all the requirements of relativity. The preferred coordinate system, I recall, is the coordinate system from which all the fundamental observer look around themselves and see isotropic and homogeneity for all the physical quantities that are needed to describe the evolution of the universe. This is a preferred coordinate system. And in terms of this, we can define cosmic time because we have this sort of congruence of time-like curves. Now, Eddington 1920 writes, uh, space and time are restored, universal space and time are restored for cosmic time phenomena and relativity is reduced to a local phenomenon, local because the special theory of relativity holds only for a, a small region on the tangent space of the variably curved uh, Riemannian manifold. So you can reduce <clears throat> from this variably curved manifold to a very small flat region in the tangent space to all points. So that basically relativity uh, is just hold, special relativity holds as a local phenomenon. So uh, this uh, non-invariance of time, um, which is just as been mentioned before, namely that there is no global temporal order, this fact is somehow overcome given cosmic time. And here we have genes, past, present, and future have real objective meanings and are not mere hallucinations of our individual minds. So we're free to believe that time is real and that we find a distinction between time and space. As soon as we abandon local physics, local physics again is the physics where special relativity holds and call the astronomy of the universe to our aid. <clears throat> again, such surfaces possess some of the properties of the Newtonian place of simultaneity. And now I want to explain why there is this sort of some quasi-absolute side time and so on and so forth. The thing is that uh, there is this global order, cosmic time, but of course uh, time in the, in the general theory of relativity depends on the height of a gravitational source, for instance, <clears throat> uh, a physical entity very close to, say, a source of strong gravitational uh, attraction will experience a slower rate of time with respect to uh, time as is measured by an observer which is far away, who's far away from, say, a black hole. So uh, time, the rate of time depends on the height and the gravitational source which is not the case in Newtonian space time. Of course, the presence of matter um, uh, turns space time into a dynamic 
uh, entity. So uh, the, the structure, the geometric structure of space time depends on the presence of matter. And of course, locally, we know that uh, uh, there is a dependence of temporal and spatial interval uh, with respect to uh, moving, relative, inertially moving uh, inertial frames. And well, I put a quote here a quotation which is taken from a famous meeting that took place in uh, Collège de France in 1922, where Einstein and Bergson were put together to debate on the nature of time. And Maillesson, a French philosopher, asked Einstein, well, time is inseparable from space. This is what we learned from Miskowski. But don't you think that even in the general theory of relativity, this inseparability does not imply uh, the absence of any difference? And Einstein replied, yes. So again, here we have a clear picture. There are some analogy between Newtonian space-time and cosmic time. But of course, there are wide essential differences that are just reported <clears throat> in this slide. Now, when I said, or when I titled my talk, does cosmic time exist? Quay philosopher, I have to explain what I mean by existence here. We have seen that uh, Cosmic time is a mathematical function of the man from the manifold to the real numbers. So obviously, uh, it, this is an abstract entity. We're talking about the function. We're talking, say, about the frame of reference. This is not the kind of existence that I am after. What about physical existence? Uh, well, uh, cosmic time exists, basically, if the universe as a global structural property that is satisfied if and only if a Weyl's principle holds. And Weyl's principle basically can be explained by thinking again to this rope and the fibers that never intercept themselves. So Weyl in 1923 clearly somehow anticipated the Big Bang cosmology because he thought that if there was, if there was this congruence of world lines that never intersect, they must uh, basically come from a very far distant past, and then they become broader and broader in the future. And this is a congruence in the sense that none of these two uh, world lines intersect. Again, if they intersected, we would have some sort of a rotation in space time. And then there is a metaphysical sense, which has been introduced uh, to defend some sort of presentist uh, view of the universe, namely that only the present exists, or maybe the past and the present exist. And some metaphysicians have used this possibility of slicing, slicing cosmic time in this hypersurface of orthogonality to basically justify the idea that presentism, after all, is not against. Uh, physical worldview, it is possibly rejected by the special theory of relativity because there it's, it's a partial order, but in the general theory we have a cosmic order of time. Now, I want to come to a close now, I guess in 15 minutes I should be able to wrap things up. It is important, and I just anticipated this before, <laughs> that cosmic time can be introduced if and only if we perform some sort of average in the motion of matter. And we go large scale, because if we look at the sky around us, we obviously see that matter is not distributed isotropically. It is also distributed in an anisotropic way if we look at the various galaxies around us. <clears throat> so you have to go to a much larger scale to assume that if you again attribute this enormous masses to a single particle, this particle will be at rest with respect to the frame that helps us to introduce a cosmic time. 
again, isotropy and homogeneity is also is only valid when you go uh, to very large scales. So somehow you have to also impose that this fundamental particle moves with the mean motion of matter. So it's basically transported by the evolution, but with respect to the frame by which its transporter is at rest. So when do we introduce this? At what scale? That's the problem. Are we allowed to talk about the mean motion of matter? And how far do we have to go in order to talk about isotropy? If we don't have isotropy and homogeneity, we don't have cosmic time. And if we want to talk about the evolution of the universe, we have to have cosmic time. So cosmic time seems some sort of necessary condition to talk, for instance, about the age of the universe. Remember that the universe at the time within the special theory of relativity is not defined, it's meaningless because which time are we referring to? There is an infinity number of times relative to different arbitrarily chosen inertial frames. Here we have a privilege frame given or due to the distribution of matter in the universe. So how can we justify the cosmological principle? And how large again is the scale relevant for isotropy of the universe? Uh, now let me summarize for you a famous argument that Gödel put forth in 1949 uh, by which or using which he wanted to prove that time is unreal. Time is unreal in the same sense in which MacTaggart in 1908 claimed that time is unreal. Gödel basically was convinced that the relative special theory, the special theory and the general theory of relativity supported from an empirical viewpoint Kant's philosophy of time. So time had to do more with the, our way of organizing our sensation than with something that, as in Newtonian case, exists independently of matter, independently of us. So this is the argument. <clears throat> and again, remember that Gödel here is trying to reject Jane Jean's idea in 1936 in terms of which we can now talk in general relativity, in certain cosmological models so being isotropy and homogeneity, we can talk about the difference, a global difference between past, present, and future. So Gödel says, no, it's, that's not possible because my solution to the Einstein field equations do not admit cosmic time. And now we see why. This is his argument. Time is real, writes, if uh, only if change is real. So this is the old Aristotelian idea. If there's no change, there's no time. And this is the crucial passage of his argument, which is to be found, by the way, in Einstein, uh, scientist philosopher, uh, those volumes edited by Schilp. <laughs> the crucial passage is uh, there is real change only if time passes. So something um, that requires this view of becoming, which he interprets as a successive coming into being and they use a reality. So reality somehow is not a Texas block. Now from two and three, you see that you can derive time is real only uh, time passes, but this is the crucial assumption, which is somehow unjustified as we will see time passes only if cosmic time exists. So it basically claims that unless you have cosmic time, you cannot talk in a meaningful way of the reality of time, because time is real only if there is this successive coming into being, but this must happen at a cosmic level. <laughs> and the conclusion is time is unreal because cosmic time does not exist in all models. We had seen that in this symmetric models of general relativity, whenever we have isotropy and homogeneity, we can talk about cosmic time. There is no rotation of galaxies around a given inertial trajectory. Remember, 
cosmic time entails no close time like curse. And in this sort of universe that he devised, in fact, it is possible to travel uh, in time from any point to any other point. I'm not going to illustrate this uh, space time. All I'm saying is uh, he reasons in this way, cosmic time, if it's something existent, ought to be model independent and ways of averaging, averaging independent. Uh, the model dependence is obvious because his rotating universes don't have cosmic time, but solve the field equations. If a model solves some equation, it means that it's physically possible. It may not be the case that the actual universe, as this galaxy is rotating around any sort of inertial trajectory, we don't see rotations, but for Gödel, what matters is that there is a possible world in which this is in fact the case. And the other argument, which is important for us, is that the value of the mean motion of matter, we, we call that uh, we can have isotropy only if we go at the large scale, we get this cluster of galaxy, we reduce its mass to a single particle. We introduce this idea that this particle moves with the mean motion of matter, and then we get isotropy and homogeneity. And because isotropy allows you to define cosmic time so that the proper time of each fundamental observer can be extended to the other fundamental observers. So the expansion of the universe is completely isotropic if regarded, if seen from any of these fundamental observers. So how do we calculate this main motion of matter? This is Gödel's question. Well, we need arbitrary elements. For instance, how large do these regions have to be? I was talking about cluster and above, but of course, a cluster is an enormous uh, um, physical entity. I mean, its size, uh, I guess varies from a hundred million light years if we consider a cluster of galaxies, we certainly go higher than this. And we know that we can basically go very far in this scale, but how far we have to go is not clear, which basically concludes Gödel entails that cosmic time as not precise definition. Well, my objection to this argument is as fol are as follows. Why not being happy or content with the contingent distribution of matter? Why would cosmic time have to exist if in uh, uh, all physically possible model it's definable? We have to look at the way matter is distributed in an actual universe. So as long as um, our observation support the idea of isotropy and therefore the idea of cosmic time, there's no rotation, we have uh, excellent evidence in order to attack Gödel's argument. And then again, this statistical problem, we don't know how to calculate this mean motion of matter. What are the weights that we have to introduce to calculate this mean or this average? Well, I mean, you can think about the way temperature is defined. Temperature is the mean molecular, the, the mean molecular motion. And we talk about the mean motion of the molecules. Of course, we introduce a statistical uh, concept. But the fact that say temperature is definable in terms of a statistical notion does not entail that temperature does not exist, even if it's identical with mean molecular notion. So the fact that we use statistical physical concept does not entail that they do not exist. Of course, one could uh, argue, well, but cosmic time implies idealization. <laughs> but of course, even uh, the notion of inertial frame entails idealization. We know that there are no physical systems that are not subject to the force of gravity. 
And I think I should skip this argument and maybe I should skip also this slide because we're coming to a close. And there's a final objection here, which I think is interesting that it's been put forward by <clears throat> a couple of philosophers of physics. As in uh, uh, Newtonian time, uh, there is no identity of instance uh, so that one instant can be switched with another instant and the structure of time doesn't change. And another property that the general relativistic <clears throat> manifold have is they are uh, invariant and the change of scale. So think about uh, the origin of the universe. Think about the path of two light rays. Think about the path of two time-like curves. Uh, imagine that the distance between one card which composed the universe and the other card in one scale is three days. We are free to introduce another scale in terms of which the distance between those two cards of course, a temporal distance is 100 years. And there's no way, basically, to eliminate this uh, invariance, which, of course, weakens the idea that we can talk about a unique cosmic time. So here we have an order, but we don't have any duration. And this is another argument which is closely related uh, to uh, the first, namely, uh, Cosmic time is definable only in models which uh, basically introduce this high degree of symmetry, isotropy and homogeneity, no rotation of galaxies, and this idealization will sooner or later be abandoned. Well, let's go to the second point. We have no time to uh, examine the first. Predictions here do not count because basically this is a simple minded argument is claiming since it's very idealized, sooner or later our physics will give a much more concrete, less idealized description of the relevant phenomena. But I don't see why and how this sort of argument based on induction can be defended. So let us go now before I finish to the, to the empirical side and to the uh, more historical critical arguments in order to conclude my talk. I am close to 50 minutes, right? Uh, yes, um, actually you, you can talk for another five. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. ciao Giorgio, ti vedo con mes. Now, the problem of underdetermination is very important in cosmology, but I will try to basically claim that uh, there are reasons to postulate uh, cosmic time in certain stages of the, of the evolution of the universe, not across all stages. Um, now, the evidence is now being uh, as you can see, the evidence is usually, uh, does usually make reference to uh, this <clears throat> measurement more and more accurate of the cosmic uh, background, microwave background radiation, which is isotropic very precisely, one part of a uh, 10 to the six, same evidence we have with gamma rays and radio sources. And there is a sense in which the redshift of galaxies can be explained by the system of these fundamental particles, which we talked about, that co-move with the mean motion of matter. Here, I'm sorry, but I have to just uh, go uh, rather quickly. As you know, this uh, microwave uh, radiation formed approximately 300,000 uh, years after the so-called T equals zero, when, <coughs> when radiation became uh, transparent. There's a nice uh, paper that I found, which I think is too ambitious, but uh, you know, it shows 
uh, in what sense physicists and astrophysicists are trying to find a well uh, posed or, or well defined notion of isotropy. A diamond demonstrating cosmological principle has proven to be a formidable challenge. The crossover scale above which the galaxy distribution becomes statistically isotropic, how large is this large scale? That's the trouble. Is vaguely defined and poorly quantified. This was exactly Gödel's complaint and also Dick's complaint, which I had no time to go over. But they claim to have found the formulism that in an operational way allow us to provide an unambiguous definition uh, according to which we can basically uh, come out with this 150 megaparsec as somehow the approximate limit after which we can have isotropy. As you can imagine, uh, finding this very precise uh, numerical threshold seems philosophically rather weak. Uh, and then there are other possibly well-known objections to the existence of, of cosmic time and therefore uh, to the reasonableness of the cosmological principle. There are these uh, toric universes where the universe looks homogeneous because uh, you are basically looking into your past and you see an infinite amount of times the same image. So this is a possible alternative theory to explain homogeneity and isotropy. There are studies, uh, very recent ones, that uh, claim that the universe could be anisotropic because of a variation in the velocity of the expansion. And let me go to the picture here. Well, if the velocity of expansion were uniform, we would have we would have to see this yellow spot more uh, evenly distributed. Instead, this blue region seems to indicate in this physicist's analysis that there is some sort of anisotropic velocity of expansion. So, the, as you can see, the question is rather open from an empirical point of view. And there are events horizon and particle horizons. Events horizons are region hypersurface that screen forever part of the universe which is observable from a mother part which is not observable. And then there are particle horizons which are due to the fact that all our empirical information about the universe comes from the past like um, and of course, with the passage of time, uh, we can uh, imagine that more and more light, more and more uh, non-massless stuff will intersect our world line. So we will find out more about the universe. But these are obvious limitations that we have to consider when we want to talk about uh, the cosmological principle and therefore a cosmic time function and therefore isotropy. All of these notions are strictly linked together. What I would like to put forward is the idea that given induction, given that we have no reason to doubt that the part that has not been observed, particle horizon in this case, we have no reason to believe that this uh, as yet unobserved part um, is not being observed. We have no reason to believe that it's non-isotropic, given that the region that we have observed is isotropic. This is a very common problem in science. We always extrapolate from the past experience to the future. So uh, I think, uh, Sylvia, we're very yes, close uh, to- Actually, yeah, if you can wrap up. Uh, we yeah, will... I mean, the idea here is that uh, the part that I wanted to develop, which is somehow the part that I think is more original in all this, uh, is that we have to introduce this uh, cosmic time function in order to 
describe uh, the evolution of the universe. And in order to attribute, for instance, a certain age of the or to the universe. Uh, the idea here is that uh, in each physical theory, uh, I have to skip all of this. We have to distinguish between certain uh, core assumption of the theory and other, say, laws or lower level uh, assumptions that can be somehow derived from the more important assumption. For instance, uh, Newton's three laws of motion are obviously somehow constitutive in this sense of Newtonian mechanics, <clears throat> because when we try to solve a specific problem, we have to find the force function. So in this sense, these three laws of motion constitute, because they provide a ground to Newtonian mechanics. The same happens for a quantum mechanics in the non-relativistic uh, version. A Schrodinger's equation is constitutive of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And the ground for the search for a particular Hamiltonian rests on this more fundamental equation. In the case of Newtonian mechanics, we have basically the same uh, sort of division between a part which is constitutive or more fundamental than another part of a physical theory. For instance, Euclidean geometry had to be presupposed for Newton's mechanics. The light principle had to be presupposed as an axiom in the special theory of relativity. The principle of equivalence is a precondition to uh, construe the general theory of relativity. And I think we have to be careful here because being constitutive doesn't mean to be devoid of physical meaning because we have very strong confirmation from an empirical point of view that the equivalence principle hold. And just to conclude with some quotations, and then maybe we can talk about possible uh, additional points in the question and answer period, Hermann Weil was the first to point out that if we have to have a cosmological model which explains the uh, expansion, he talks about stars, but he was actually uh, talking about this sort of redshift of one star from the other impose this congruence of time-like curves. Again, a family of non-intersective time-like curves. And without this assumption, he claims, it's not possible to do cosmology because it's not possible to explain what we obviously uh, empirically uh, validated, namely the fact that galaxies seem to receive from any point in the universe with a velocity which is basically proportional to the distance. So this is, I take this congruence that by posed a precondition to uh, use the cosmological principle because the cosmological principle presupposes the, the existence of a congruence in terms of which you then define isotropy and homogeneity. And uh, I guess that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, this material is, as you can see, sort of complicated. I'm trying to open my way through it. There are parts that I had to, to leave out, but I guess the, 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 you know, the, the, the thrust of the talk, I hope, uh, went through. So thanks for uh, the attention, Giorgio. I don't know whether you hear me. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mauro. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, so, uh, Giorgio Mirzi, do you want to say something uh, first? He probably has to uh, switch on the microphone. Giorgio? Yes. Uh, maybe, uh, Silvia, uh, why don't you write a text to him? I will try to do it. I have written to him, but uh, probably he's maybe he's not he's not uh, listening or 
No, I think he, he's there, but uh, maybe we have problems. Maybe just uh, uh, audio, you know, the microphone. I don't know, something like that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, well, uh, okay, oh. anyway, um, so, well, thank you very much, uh, Mauro. I, uh, now we have our Q&A, so I kindly ask people who want to uh, ask questions to our speaker to raise their hands uh, in the chat. Or How many people are we, Sylvia? I don't, I cannot count. Oh, we have nine people, so oh, <laughs> there okay. are people, actually. Uh, so, um, I, I can uh, eventually start with some questions and then see when... Uh, yeah, a nice breaking question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's my function <laughs> as well. Not just that, but also this one. Um, no, I find it very interesting, especially... Well, let's start with the first question I have in mind. Uh, so the one uh, uh, related to... Related to your reading of uh, constitutive principles here in this uh, in this context. Uh, yes. so you uh, you made reference to Reichenbach. Um, so um, I don't know whether the people who listen to the talk are familiar with the uh, uh, the notion of relativas a priori, uh, <laughs> with the following work by uh, Friedman in more recent times on on that. By the way, my question is the following. So. Um, the relativized a priori applies, uh, well, in more recent literature to both uh, constitutive and regulative principles, right? So, um, and of course, uh, your reading, I find it very um, coherent and uh, um, it, uh, um, it, it's convincing uh, uh, with regard to uh, the fact that um, uh, cosmic time um, 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 and also a reading of it uh, um, uh, in terms of um, um, of, a, of a relativized a priori principle works well if you assume uh, the Big Bang. Uh, yes. Sense. Well, however, my my question is: uh, Do you think that on the ground of the recent development of uh, um, or the recent effort, let's say, towards the theory of quantum gravity, and also we know that, uh, for example, uh, we don't even have to talk about quantum gravity. Let's talk about uh, loop quantum cosmology, for example. So there are some solutions that are allowing a bouncing universe, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this case, uh, what's the scenario? And uh, what about the, um, of course, uh, let's say the philosophical interpretation then uh, of cosmic time, if any? Okay, first, uh, thanks for the question because it gives me the opportunity to explain very briefly what uh, this proposal of uh, regulative and constitutive principle really amounts to. Uh, the idea, according to Kant, is, is that there are certain components of uh, scientific theories that somehow come from us. This is very simple. I, I'm just addressing physicists that might be uh, unaware of this contribution. So, according to Kant, there are two different notions of the a priori. Uh, the a priori is something that is true forever or necessarily true. And in another sense, the a priori is what constitutes a theory. For in some of the Newtonian laws, the three laws of um, motion. And according to Reichenbach, we had to abandon the first sense of a priori because the possibility of using non-Euclidean geometry to describe the structure of the universe at a large scale implies that this constitutive uh, component of the a priori must become flexible and relativized to a certain amount of or a period of time. Yet, in each particular time, in each particular uh, development of our scientific ideas, there are some certain cores of assumptions that basically play from an epistemic point of view a more important role than other, other parts of the theory. So constitutive basically means more important to build a theory than other parts. 
And this is possible uh, or possibly very, very short explanation. As far as regulative principle, I think we can interpret them as guide or heuristic guide uh, for our scientific research. For instance, I was here, and then we go to the we go to the more complicated quantum stuff. Uh, for instance, we try to construe as far as we can theory that are deterministic. As far as we can, of course, because then the empirical evidence can just force us to abandon determinism. But the causality, of course, is an idea that we can somehow explain what happens without introducing randomness, which obviously detracts from our complete understanding of the phenomenon. I'm not so force attacking in determinism here, but I'm just saying that we have a push toward building theories that are deterministic. Another fact which is well known is that we try to uh, build theories that are uh, symmetric in the sense that they are not uh, violating again this sort of invariant assumptions that we make in order to give the most important epistemic core of a theory. And obviously another very connected notion is the notion of conserv conservative laws, conservation laws. Whenever there is a failure in uh, uh, describing a phenomenon, a failure of a conservation law, then we introduce something like Fermi did, for instance, in order to restore the validity of the conservation law. And then another regulative idea is that we try to propose theories that a generalized form of theory in the same sense in which the wave theory of light is a generalization of the, the particle theory of light, uh, special relativity generalizes Newtonian mechanics, so general relativity generalizes special relativity. And now we go to the more complicated case, namely what happens, say, before uh, decoupling, what happens say uh, 10 to the minus 11 when there was no matter. And basically at that stage of the evolution here I have prepared, when you don't have matter, you can't have the notion of cosmic time because the notion of cosmic time depends on this uh, idealization of uh, matter where you have basically uh, dusts. A grain of dust and fluids, but you have well-behaved classical physics. And when you go uh, in a regime where everything is massless, so you have, say, uh, electrons uh, hitting photons, and you don't have atoms uh, in so periods previous to uh, the formation of matter, then of course you can't have cosmic time. So you have to define the notion of cosmic time in terms of something which is not, uh, which is not time-like, time-wise, time-wise, or it's not based on time. So we have a some sort of timeless assumption that should derive um, the properties of cosmic time, but we cannot talk about cosmic time before I say. Uh, the formation of matters. So what happens in that stage, uh, I think nobody knows. Uh, the attempt to explain the emergence of time so far has no empirical confirmation. So that this cosmological principle uh, regarded as a constitutive principle of cosmology basically is limited to the stage in which we can talk about uh, uh, time-like uh, curves evolving, as you were saying correctly from, say, the past, the Big Bang, if you want. Uh, and this was the anticipation that Weil actually proposed. But the notion of cosmic time can be considered to be valid only after a certain stage in the evolution of the universe. Before that, I don't know how you can derive the idea that, say, the universe goes from one stage to the other. In What are your clocks? Because a clock is a relation with another clock. 
And if you are a relationist about time, you need a clock before uh, the formation of, of matter. But if you only have radiation, what kind of clock can you have? So I don't want to be an operationalist or a relationist about time, but you need some sort of fixed length stuff in order to measure time. So I, I don't know really what happens before a certain regime. No, but indeed I agree with you in the sense that uh, the real uh, the real challenging, uh, I mean, conceptually speaking, uh, the challenge is uh, uh, to talk about uh, um, uh, a regime uh, in which uh, basically measurement uh, as we mean it uh, in a classical sense is not... Uh, or in a, in a relativistic sense, uh, um, it's very, I mean, it's impossible, let's say, to be accomplished. Uh, um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's really challenging because uh, it means that uh, uh, in a way or another, temporality comes out from a temporality. So that's the problem. And, yes. uh, um, and uh, we are accustomed to think that the world is just uh, temporal and uh, that is homogeneous, that, uh, you know, we, we are accustomed this, to... Sure. This so, holds... so, for, so for us, it's, it's very hard. So uh, I don't know, it's just uh, to provoke an answer, but uh, maybe one uh, solution is to think of the world as being uh, both things, uh, temporal and atemporal, and in a sense... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the very notion of light cone, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, we know that for uh, lines within the cone, uh, <coughs> I mean, they, 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 they make sense. They do make sense, and uh, uh, they are respecting the postulate of the uh, finite speeds of light, and so on and so forth, and, uh, and so they are physically um, meaningful, right, for the theory. So all lines uh, that uh, go beyond uh, 45 degrees, let's say, and that, uh, uh, you know, are out of, uh, uh, of the uh, light cone, let's say, or, um, you know, uh, that, uh, that uh, drops out of it, uh, um, they are not physically meaningful. So this is uh, at least uh, one of the ways in which uh, we can... Uh, we can read uh, <clears throat> this wonderful tool, which is the the light cone, no? and uh, and uh, what uh, what's what's saying to us is that for uh, for relativity theory, uh, signals uh, traveling faster than light are you know uh, uh, reference. So so it it's it, it's telling us um, oh there might be things you know that. Um, 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 are out of our spatial temporal, uh, you know, world. Um, there might be, but the world that is significant for us, for our theory, is just this one. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we as philosophers, let's say, we would say, well, okay, but uh, from a metaphysical standpoint, you're not saying that the entire universe is just spatial temporal. We can uh, think of, uh, you know, our world uh, as being containing both temporality and atemporality, and this changes completely the um, question about cosmic time as well, because, uh, you know, so in a sense, and, and we can still continue reading it in terms of relativized a priori, we can, we can of course, uh, put forward these readings to, in, to interpret cosmic time, but, uh, but it's a matter of fact that uh, um, uh, we have as philosophers to think about different possible solutions uh -huh. let's say, to make uh, 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 philosophy compatible uh, with physics and also the recent development of physics uh, with the fundamental theories that we already have and that work wonderfully and thinking of relativity I mean of course. Exactly but my worry is uh, given that there is some sort of continuous transition from 10 to the minus 43, say, to 10 to the minus 11, and there are this, say, um, formation of, of atoms, all of this should have been, uh, should have taken, maybe, you know, there is this inflatant field or whatever. I don't know very much about this. My uh, question is, uh, what kind of clocks do we use uh, before a certain... Uh, 
period of the evolution of the universe. What I was saying about the cosmological uh, principle and about cosmic time only refers to the observable universe. So I've been very careful not to uh, go over uh, whatever uh, we defined before as a, as a particle horizon. But if you want to talk about the time of the universe, you have to consider certain clocks. And we do have clocks in the case of cosmic time because you can relate, say, the atomic clocks to the, the clocks that somehow can be carried by these fundamental observers. But before uh, a certain a certain moment in the, in the evolution of the universe, say when you only have radiation, uh, I don't know, it, this is really a matter of ignorance. I don't know what kind of clock you can use. Well, there are some- uh, I'm sure there are some-, uh, some No, there are some proposals in, uh, you know, quantum gravity approaches uh, or better in the cosmological scenarios of, uh, of these approaches. By the way, there is a, a hand raised by Lorenzo Maccone. So if you don't mind, I will uh, let him speak because otherwise sure, we will sorry, the, the, the conversation. Time. So please, Lorenzo, go ahead. Yes, very, very interesting. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, great. Uh, I, I apologize, I, I'm traveling, so I could not really follow the whole talk, but my impression is that you are using only like global uh, observations to define this cosmic time, like you consider the Gödel's universe. And, but from the definitions you gave, it seems to me that also if you have some local closed time like curves, your definition would fail, right? So for example, if you have a care black hole in our own universe, Mm -hmm. And uh, you would not, that, that if the spin is sufficiently high, it can have closed time like curves. And again, this cosmic time would fail, no? Did I understand correctly? Yes. Well, you have to distinguish, of course, from uh, local from cosmic time. I was trying to understand what the conceptual status of cosmic time is, but uh, I have tried to explain why so many philosophers and logicians as well try to criticize um, the somehow the ontological uh, force of cosmic time by transforming it into a computational device. And you imagine, you idealize that the universe is some sort of symmetric structure, and then you can talk about this. Um, isotropic and uh, homogeneous universe. But of course, locally, as you were saying, things are not so fine. And you don't have isotropy locally, but you still have time, of course. Right. You have time, you have a local succession of events, but you don't have cosmic time. So cosmic yes. time needs this idealization, but you do have time in the local sense. So, the problem is how you connect <clears throat> the local to the global. But if we consider the universe around us uh, at the local scale, of course you don't have you don't have cosmic time. Cosmic time seems to be needed only to talk about the large scale structure of the universe. Okay, okay. Yes, that, maybe that, I was confused would, by, would, by yeah, your definitions, would. which were referred to to this uh, differentiable function, which is growing along time-like curves. But, yes. Okay, that, that can only also be done uh, at the local level. And it can also fail at the local level. I guess that was the point. Oh, I see. Well, but in fact, there you need also the, the cosmological principle in yes, the sense yes, that yes. the world must basically look the same around any parts or any time-like curves in the universe, while uh, of see. course you can have a very small region where you have isotropy, but you wouldn't call that cosmic time, you would call that a local time. So I guess I cosmic time somehow by definition is a time that refers to 
the universe at large. So when you somehow neglect small deviation from this uh, Back, micro, micro backward, uh, microwave background radiation, which seems to be highly isotropic. So you can basically use that as evidence that there is an isotropic evolution of the universe. But again, as Sylvia said, I'm just confining myself to the observable universe. Um, I don't know what happens with time before. Of course, when you go to the Planck regime, maybe there's there is no time, but, but again, you don't have cosmic time even before, before uh, going to the Planck scale, if you don't have mass. I mean, maybe with radiation, you can introduce this sort of statistical average, but I don't know how you can do it. I'm just saying you need clocks in order to talk about time. Time is a relation between two physical systems and I mean, uh, perhaps, I'm not sure that would work, but uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, you can use the uh, uh, Meisner Thorn uh, Wheeler definition mm -hmm. of event like the crossing of world lines. See, yes. And then you can consider light, light rays, and then you can have a succession of events by crossing light rays. I don't know. Yes. It's just a thought. Well, well, Maybe that, that would yes. work only also in a massless case. Yes, but what is the what is then the what gives you the, the rate of uh, of change in this case? I mean, you can have, for instance, uh, the, a light clock. Of course, uh, you have light bouncing from one sur upper surface to a, a, a lower surface, and then keeps on bouncing. But but there you have to have some sort of of light. Of, of something that is somehow rigid. And the notion of rigidity is, is difficult, of course, or it's impossible when you have only radiation. I'm not saying that you cannot have a light clock of some kind, but I think cosmic time can only be defined in certain uh, universes where you have matter. And in- yeah, Yes, I, I see, I see. Yes. Th th that was my only point. I'm sure there are attempts which I don't know very well about, but I don't know, I don't know much about in which people are trying to uh, define clocks in terms of radiation. You have to have that because of course you want to extrapolate back toward the Planck time. So you have to have some sort of, some sort of clock and the redshift of galaxies, of course, uh, seem to entail that if you go back in time, there is some sort of convergence of these time-like curves representing the fundamental observers. But what happens beyond, I don't know to the effect that time seems to me a relation between two physical systems, which presupposes some sort of uh, fixed length uh, structure. And the constitutivity seems to me just the only way to make sense of a concept which even empirically is subject to a lot of criticism. This large scale, how large is the scale? What kind of mean motion of matter do we have to examine? Uh, so clocks, uh, again, are somehow idealized here. Well, I think that uh, we are talking about regimes that are, uh, you know, um, object of, uh, um, uh, I mean, we have different approaches uh, to quantum gravity. We don't have a, a final theory of quantum gravity. On the other hand, we have uh, uh, other approaches, uh, other theories. I mean, I'm thinking about uh, string theory now, uh, for example. Um, but uh, we don't have any empirical evidence that uh, brings us uh, towards one approach or the other. Uh, we are producing sort of toy models, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just playing uh, and waiting for, you know, some indirect 
um, signal coming from, for example, primordial gravitational waves, but we have to wait for the mm -hmm. for the experiments and for the missions, you know, to yes. uh, to be so. So we are in a in a in an epoch of, uh, epoch of transition, I would say. Uh, so um, we have the privilege, you know, to um, to reflect upon uh, our current theories, uh, our perspective theories, uh, but still we are uh, we're like uh, you know um, uh, we're depending on uh, on variables that uh, would be really uh, clear in uh, in years, decades, I would say. So so. Uh, but still, it's uh, it's uh, important, I think, for philosophers to, to discuss about this and to uh, and also to to try to see what the possible implications of these uh, alternative approaches to fundamental physics ca ca can and also cosmology uh, could uh, uh, reveal. I can see that George Mirzi has his microphone uh, switched on, so I don't know whether he now can uh, say something. Or want to say something? No. Uh, so he's there, but um, we cannot hear him. I don't know why. Anyway. But what about <clears throat> this hypothesis that you either have time in the universe as a fundamental ingredient, or you can never uh, explain its its existence from something else. I mean, I, I know there are attempts to, 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 to basically describe the evolution of the universe at the plant scale where there are quantum effects, but uh, won't we have some sort of causation at that stage? We, we, we can, uh, I mean, uh, maybe somebody can correct me <clears throat> if I'm saying something wrong, but uh, there are approaches, I mean, in non-commodative geometry uh, through which you can, uh, Basically, from uh, temporal no locality, derive uh, um, um, locally local light mm -hmm. core. So you you you, you, you can do that. The problem is that uh, um, <clears throat> there are other uh, issues. Even if you um, if you assume this ten point, uh, there are many many issues, and and even if you solve them still you have the problem that you cannot test it in the lab. You cannot observe uh, anything like that because we are talking about either uh, high energy that we can never reach, you know, uh, or uh, you're talking about uh, short distances that are not detectable mm -hmm. in the lab. So either way, um, uh, you can produce something that is uh, consistent and that uh, you have to work a lot of, uh, on predictions. So these, these, alternative, uh, these alternative approaches uh, or better, yeah, these different versions, you know, call, call them as you want of quantum gravity. I mean, they... Uh, they, 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 their only hope is that they can produce uh, um, certain uh, um, um, implications, certain predictions uh, uh, that in an indirect or direct way at some point we will observe. So that's the only thing. And primordial gravitational waves uh, are good candidates for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for this. Um, all the study of the B modes, uh, uh, of the CMB, so I mean, this, this is the, the this is what what what's in our hands right now. But let's wait. I mean, uh, maybe that uh, in uh, in twenty years uh, there will be other uh, things on the table. I mean, we are investing uh, money and effort in space uh, missions and uh, in. Um, but I don't think that uh, um, uh, it would be very easy, you know, to. Uh, to see in the, in the very near future um, answers with respect to those energy scales that we are talking about, plus, um, even if it's the case, uh, uh, some data can fit with 
one or more of these approaches. So this is not just uh, ruling out everything, you know, living just one uh, option alive. So, um, so that that's um, so that it, it's complicated. I, I agree. Also, we didn't talk about uh, uh, quantum fluctuations today. We didn't talk about uh, uh, you know. Um, what happens in the in the, in the recombination uh, with it? So, but but it's very complicated to assess. Uh, um, let's say what's beyond um, uh, the 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 wonderful picture that the CMB you know uh, that we have of the CMB. It's very it's very yeah. very hard. I, I want to put forward a, a crazy hypothesis. First of all, uh, I think that this, I know very little, if nothing, about quantum uh, loop, quantum gravity, string theory. I think theorists, physical, uh, theoretical physicists, philosophers of physics should really cooperate in order to solve conceptual, mathematical, and hopefully experimental devices uh, in order to test one of these theories. But what about the possibility that we will never be able to explain time. So time is such a fundamental component of the universe that it can never be somehow explained in terms of something that is timeless. Uh, let's make another example here. Think about David Chalmers' view that unless you put somehow some sort of consciousness in the universe, you will not be able to explain it. So of course there are various degrees of integration. Uh, you have plants which are very, very, uh, somehow whose consciousness is obviously uh, not particularly developed. Then there are human beings, but somehow as Leibniz would say, there are, there is consciousness all the way down. And what about the possibility that you cannot explain time unless you put it there at the beginning? This is just a pure speculation. There's nothing more than, say, a question that I pose. Given that there is this problem of underdetermination, even in classical cosmology, we don't know what happens uh, beyond the observable universe. As yeah, you said, um... we only have access to this uh, cosmic background radiation, and then, of course, gamma rays and uh, radio sources. Uh, but lights. Light comes from the past light cone. We don't know what's behind yeah. oh, and also, the event horizon. So, I mean, I'm not, don't want to play the skeptic here, but there's a lot of philosophy here that we should <laughs> contemplate even before going into the quantum gravity game, even remaining at the classical level. Absolutely. I want to know how you can introduce in a meaningful way this congruence of role lines, which give you the possibility of introducing isotropy and homogeneity. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you more. I firmly believe that uh, we cannot uh, really advance uh, without understanding in a deeper way uh, time and space time from relativity, and then we can move to eventually yes. quantum I agree. I'm, I'm absolutely, um, I mean, I'm, I agree with you. The other, the other issue is that um, uh, we use um, we use language. We are human beings, uh, you know. We um, we use language. We use mathematics. Likely, uh, we can use different types of algebra that uh, can uh, uh, describe uh, these uh, early phases of uh, of the universe. Uh, of course, we cannot gain uh, empirical. Uh, you know, uh, confirmation uh, for them, but still uh, we can build up coherent toy models. Uh, and uh, I think that philosophers can uh, um, exploit, so to speak, this phase uh, mm -hmm. that uh, physicists are living um, in the sense that uh, um, if we work on these toy models, we can find out perhaps original patterns um, in order to think of uh, temporality, causality, uh, you know. Um, so we can, uh, we can uh, anyway uh, continue um, uh, refining uh, ontology, 
uh, well, not metaphysics as well, uh, or in general, uh, philosophy of science, because uh, uh, we can uh, gain more information about, uh, uh, you know, the way in which uh, a theory that, uh, like GR, you know, that uh, is not capable of describing uh, certain regimes, or at least that... Uh, um, it is false. The theory is certainly false. It's but, false. Of course, it's not false. Um, in its own domain of application. It's false if you extend it to domains which she cannot or it cannot describe at the moment. So if you want to merge it with quantum mechanics, but, quantum field theory, of course we, we know that something will have to change, but whenever we go very far away from the here and now, we know that there's going to be, as you were very correctly saying, complete upheaval in our uh, knowledge of the universe. So there will be radical revolutions because we know so little about the big and the large. That's why I was trying to claim that given that the empirical arguments in favor of cosmic time are somehow uh, counterbalance and you have this underdetermination maybe we live in these small universes where light like Lumine, even Ellis put forward the idea that we live in a, on, on a thorus on a torus so that if we are located in a particular part of the point of the torus light keeps on coming back an infinite amount of times we perceive isotropy but basically uh, that's the explanation of isotropy it's nothing to do with fundamental observers or largest structure of the universe because the volume of the torus is more. That's why I thought we need, given the empirical evidence is still weak, even in favor of cosmic time, we need to assume this principle of, say, uh, the Baal principle, the congruence, or even the cosmological principle in order to give some coherence to what we know so far. Yeah. But of course, empirically speaking, one day we may have to abandon even this large scale hypothesis about the structure of, of, of the classical uh, general relativity. It's, it's a theory with, with an amazing amount of confirmation, but there is a lot of underdetermination in any theory which is far far, far remote from our experience. So as philosophers, we should always be very, very aware that uh, we shouldn't trespass the limits of what is empirically observable. So even the inflation explains a lot of things, of course, but the fact that you explain something doesn't mean that you have independent prediction of your um, Experiments. So you need something which combines explanatory power, but also predictive power. Otherwise, well, yeah, yeah, predictive power is, uh, as I said, uh, so the, yes. the only way in which we can get out of this impasse, I think, is uh, is um, in a sense to privilege uh, those approaches that uh, are able to uh, make some sensible prediction that can be tested. So Absolutely. otherwise, uh, we and are really. Um, yeah, well, anyway, Mauro, okay, I, I thanks for, like to for thank you a lot for, for the conversation. I don't know that uh, whether there are other questions. Uh, um, I don't think so. Uh, anyway, um, thanks a lot again. Thank you for, for it was a, an amazing talk. Thanks a lot. And thanks uh, a lot to you. And, and let's thanks to for the you. present, of course, the audience. And uh, all right, so we'll be in touch. Yeah. And good evening to all. Thank you. Thank uh, you.